It's a policy idea that perks your ears up. Universal basic income. While some view that concept as antithetical to the American economic system, presidential candidate Andrew Yang says it will be absolutely necessary to save the economy for regular people as automation and artificial intelligence take over. Mr. Yang is our guest this morning. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So uh, before we jump into the, the meat of that policy discussion, tell us a little bit about yourself, your business background, and why you're running for president. Uh, yes, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I started an organization called Venture for America that helped create thousands of jobs across the country in cities like Detroit, Cleveland, Providence, St. Louis, Birmingham, and other cities in the Midwest and the South primarily. And while I was doing that work, I realized that we had automated away four million manufacturing jobs uh, throughout the Midwest and the South, which in my mind led directly to Donald Trump winning the election in 2016. And my friends in Silicon Valley know we're about to do the exact same thing to millions of retail jobs, call center jobs, fast food jobs, and most crucially, truck driving jobs throughout the economy. And uh, in your book, The War on Normal People, you start with a quote from Stephen Hawking that really caught my eye. Quote, we are at the most dangerous moment in the development of humanity because of the rise of artificial intelligence and automation. How do you explain what's happening to someone on Elm Street here in Manchester without this sounding like a science fiction novel? Too far like out. I, I totally get it. Um, and so to, to the people of New Hampshire, and I went to high school here, uh, to the people of New Hampshire, I would just ask this question. Have you noticed your Main Street stores and businesses closing? And now you don't think of that as related to technology or artificial intelligence or automation, but the fact is the reason why Main Street stores are closing is that Amazon is sucking up an additional $20 billion in commerce every year, a lot of that from Main Street businesses, and it's pushing 30% of U.S. malls and Main Street stores into closing. So that, you don't think, oh, that's high technology. It's not like robots walking the street here in New Hampshire. But you, I guarantee you, if you go to an Amazon fulfillment warehouse, then you will see the robots. <laughs> so that's something that's impacting people in New Hampshire right now. And the rubber will really hit the road when cars and trucks start becoming autonomous in the next several years. So how does a universal basic income uh, fit into this template and solve the problem? Well, what's great about a universal basic income or the freedom dividend, and I almost named it after uh, the people here in New Hampshire, <laughs> the, but the freedom dividend would channel about $8 billion in new uh, buying power into the hands of uh, New Hampshire moms, uh, dads, uh, really any adult would have $1,000, and that would channel all this money that would go right back into the Main Street economy here in New Hampshire. It would go to car repairs, the occasional night out, tutoring and, and food for your kids, home repairs you've been putting off, and all that money would stay right here in New Hampshire. It would create about 15,000 new jobs right here. And that's what you need because right now, those jobs are getting sucked up into the cloud by Amazon and eventually by the self-driving cars and trucks that are coming uh, to our highways very soon. Are there any other countries that have done this with any measure of success? I read uh, Finland, it sounds like, experimented with it, but it didn't sound like they did enough people or uh, made it big enough to really figure out. So has anyone proved that this actually works? Well, you know, you don't have to even look abroad where there's been one state that has had a dividend in effect for 36 years. Uh, and in that state, everyone gets between one and $2,000 a year, no questions asked. It's wildly popular, has created thousands of jobs, uh, and improves uh, children's health. And that state is Alaska, where they've had an oil dividend in a very deeply conservative state uh, for since the early 80s. Uh, and so what I say to people is like, look, what is the oil of the 21st century? And if you reflect on that question for a moment, you realize that the oil of the 21st century is technology, software, artificial intelligence, self-driving cars and trucks. Do you worry at all about fostering government dependence here? You know, it's actually quite the opposite because, uh, you know, and I think there's a real libertarian streak here in New Hampshire, but Milton Friedman, who's the patron saint of libertarian uh, economics, was for this plan because there's nothing more liberating than having economic freedom. And so if everyone watching this or listening to this thinks, what would you do with an extra $1,000 a month? That would create independence. And this is the opposite of so many government bureaucracies and programs where there are all these requirements and strings attached. Um, this is no strings attached. It would actually cut a lot of the red tape and lighten up the bureaucracy that right now is uh, 
constraining the choices of many, many Americans. And last question on this topic, but how do you pay for this? This sounds like it's going to be a pretty big outlay in addition to all of the other uh, major programs that you're proposing, but how do you end up paying for this freedom dividend? So you have to look at it big picture, where all of this money is getting sucked up into the cloud, and it's heading off to the coasts. So the big winners from all of these new technologies and innovations are going to be the trillion dollar tech companies, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Uber. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass a value added tax, which is going to get a lot of that money back and bring it right here to the people in New Hampshire so you can rebuild your Main Street economies. But our economy now is so vast at almost $20 trillion that a value-added tax that would fall most heavily on the companies that are benefiting from automation would be enough to pay for a $1,000 dividend for every adult. Let's shift some other domestic policy ideas right now. If you could engineer a compromise for this current government shutdown in terms of building a wall versus all of the other options there, DACA, anything like that, how would you get them back to the table what would you do if you were the president right now? Well, if I was the president, I mean, uh, like this, it would never have come to this because this wall is much more of a symbol than a solution. Uh, anyone who looks at it realistically knows that there are massive parts of the border that are going to end up not having <laughs> this, this impassable wall. You're just going to end up channeling uh, traffic and resources to, to other parts of the border. Um, so the problem right now is that our government has fallen into such a state of dysfunction that people are willing to argue over symbols. I mean, you're talking about $5 billion in the context of a federal budget. Um, it's really quite trivial, but at this point, neither Democrats nor President Trump can give an inch. Uh, and it's unfortunate that we've reached this sort of point. So if I were president, we would never be anywhere near this because I'm not the sort of person who's going to shut down a government over some symbol. Uh, I'm a CEO and business person, and you would never shut down a business because the leaders can't get along. But should the Democrats who are in Washington accept something like a barrier in exchange for reopening the government? You know, and that's the, a sign of how ridiculous things are getting, where Democrats are literally like, as long as you don't call it a wall, like maybe we'll sign on to like a barrier if it's made of steel and not concrete. I mean, it just goes to show how ridiculous this, is, this has come. I mean, the stakes are, are high enough where you'd have to consider a compromise just because in the scheme of things, again, like call it what you will, the amount of resources is trivial. Uh, and both parties should, in my opinion, agree that you need to enforce a strong border. Democrats uh, agree with that. It's just they don't want to give uh, President Trump his, uh, his symbolic wall. A lot of Democrats believe, and certainly in the base of the Democratic Party in New Hampshire, they feel like Donald Trump is unfit for office and should be impeached. Do you stand with them? You know, I think uh, President Trump is a symbol of the deep dysfunction that our economy has wrought on the American people, where at this point, 57% of Americans can't pay an unexpected $500 bill. We've blasted away 4 million manufacturing jobs. We're about to do the same thing to retail jobs and, and truck driving jobs and on and on, where people, uh, in my opinion, reached out to someone like Donald Trump because they just were, were so desperate for some kind of change uh, in a government that was failing them. And so the fact that Donald Trump is uh, not a great leader or president, to me, should not be a shock. I mean, you sort of knew that you were taking a massive gamble. Uh, and I don't think impeachment is the answer, in, in my opinion, because we need to just beat him at the ballot box and start solving the problems that got Donald Trump elected in the first place. You are a supporter of Medicare for all. Uh, if government does have a single-payer health care system. Uh, obviously, health care rationing exists no matter what system you have. But what procedures do you believe would be rationed under a government-run health care system? So uh, if you look at our health care system, we're in the worst of all worlds right now, where we're spending twice as much as other countries to worse results. And if you get sick or injured in the United States, you are more concerned about how to pay for it or navigate the bureaucracy than you are getting well. And that is completely messed up in the most advanced country in the history of the world. So the money is very, very uh, ample. Again, we're spending 18% of GDP. Like the rationing people are concerned about, it, like it is going to be uh, a non-factor for the vast, vast majority of families and procedures, uh, you know, that, that line of thought to me um, just misses the point. Um, but I will say that if you look at our expenditures, we're spending a ton of money on the last several years of life. And I think most Americans, even uh, elderly Americans, would agree that that sort of expenditure uh, might not be in the best interest of the patient or the family, much less the, the country. You're taking a very hard line on the gun issue, uh, requiring licensing for all guns. This seems like it could be a pretty big government outlay as well. You look at the DMV, we're licensing uh, drivers. Uh, that's a huge piece of our government. How do you propose to make that work 
for the people who already have guns? You know, the, the fact is there are 300 million firearms in this country, and uh, anyone who owns a gun is going to get grandfathered in to, to just about anything you would do. Um, I, I think we do have to face facts where, um, at this point, uh, uh, we, we need to intelligently um, keep track of the firearms that people are buying anew, uh, particularly if those people have a history of mental illness or a criminal record or anything of that nature. Uh, but we also have to be real about what we can do in, in, uh, in terms of people um, who own guns. There are millions of law-abiding Americans who own firearms, and they're going to continue to own those firearms, and no one should pretend otherwise. You have a lot of very interesting ideas on your website. Uh, most candidates, uh, they'll go, you know, eight or nine deep on these things. I think you've got something like a couple dozen, and a lot of very interesting it's ideas. Like 75. Them, okay, 75. Uh, you have an interesting idea for malls that have gone abandoned. What do you want to do to American malls? So 30% of malls are scheduled to close in the next four years, and those malls become blighted disasters, where if you you've ever been to a ghost mall, it's creepy. <laughs> the parking lot is like uh, scary, like you want to get out of there. And so we have to help communities repurpose these malls into community centers and art centers and residential, whatever is viable in that community. But if you do fail in that, the mall becomes uh, something that sucks the property value out of that area. It's what I call negative infrastructure. And so we have to help communities transition these malls into some sort of positive use. And as you say, I've suggested an American Mall Act that channels a uh, billion dollars or more to help make those transitions. It's certainly shocking for anyone who grew up in the 80s or 90s to see these malls abandoned. You I love my thought. local mall, man. I was right there right. with you. Yep. I'm a, I'm a child of thought, Never would have thought they would be abandoned, but here we are. Mr. Yang, thank you for your time. We'll see you back later in the campaign. Thank you so much, Adam.